that the confirm the audit and risk and finance committee minutes. All in favour, please say aye. aye. Against, carried. And then we have confirmed it. Have we? <coughs> we have <coughs> received and confirmed all in one go. Mr. Mayor, Roads, uh, Councillor Mackay. Um, an extraordinary question, Mr. Mayor. Could someone please look at the air conditioning? I think we've just had a southerly with a snowstorm arise. <laughs> Who's our Minister of Climate Change? <laughs> Item number nine, Road Safety Coordinating Committee. That the minutes of the 8th of December, by the, uh, sorry, that the minutes of the 10th of November Road Safety Quarter Coordinating Committee meeting be received. Moved, Councillor Lovett. Seconded, Councillor Rawlinson. Any discussion out of those minutes? Not uh, Councillor Rawlinson. Um, is it prudent just to mention from that um, that we've had a meeting with NZTA on the Timor Corridor just to update those that are listening that there was a workshop held here? Yep, please and, do. Um, yep. It looks like the lights will be at Agnes Street, I would say, but we'd had a very, very good workshop here with NZTA and there was interested parties who all have businesses along that street and um, I think the outcomes will be good. And they're going to report back in February. Good. It's good. And the um, the lights over the Ashburton Bridge have been repaired, fixed, going. Good. Um, I'll put the motion that we receive those minutes. All in favour, please say aye. aye. Against, carried. Biodiversity Group meeting 8th of December. <coughs> we need to receive those minutes. Councillor Lovett. I'd like to move those, thanks. And can I just make a minute? In a minute, you can. It's Councillor Rollinson yeah. seconded. Now, yeah, Councillor Lovett. I just have to say, it's probably one of the best meetings I've ever been to. It was like magic happened at that meeting when um, the Methan Lion spoke, needing um, plants and more money to plant out an area in natives. And they had the wee tap on the shoulder by Sinlay sitting right behind them. We can help you with that. And then they asked for um, some advice on planting. And then there was another wee comment in the room, we can help you with that. And it was just such a special meeting to get all that happening. It was, it was really great. Great. It just shows you the collaboration that goes on in these, these meetings. They're really worthwhile. Yeah, it shows something's working really well, so that's good. Yeah. Councillor Flynn? Yeah, just a question to round out my knowledge for the year. Can someone tell me what an insurance reserve is, please? Uh, Councillor Lovett? It is. Um, there's some very rare plants, only one or two of them left, and they're sitting on road reserves or in, on unused roads, and they would like to pick them up and put them in an area that they can um, be saved and kept for the future. Because <coughs> if they leave them where they are, they're just going to be, they'll be gone and destroyed, and it's just insurance, a, a bank for them for the future. Councillor Supplementary. So basically, the areas that are here to be set aside, uh, they will then become um, insurance reserves for these rare plants currently on roadsides. Yes. I'll put the motion. All those in favour that receive those minutes of the 8th of December Biodiversity Advisory Group, say aye. aye. Against. Carried. Item number 11, Method and Community Board Minutes. We move in a second that we receive these minutes. Councillor McMillan. I move, thank you. Councillor Bethan. Any discussion? If not, I'll put the motion. Oh, Councillor Wilson. Yes, in the Mount Up Memorial Hall. Did they have that money approved and then decided not to support it, or why? what's the story there? Uh, no, they didn't. So um, there was an application going to the uh, Methvin Community Board for the funding, um, and there'd also been some other applications going for grant funding. So 
the and the, the board decided not to the community board decided not to approve the funding. Yeah. I'll put the recommendation. All those in favour please say aye. Yep. Carried. Thank you. Moving now into reports. Item number thirteen, page thirty two and the economic impact of land and water management in District Council. And um, the author of the report, Mr Fitzgerald, if you'd like to come forward. And we have Mr McCann, uh, Fabish assisting. And as councillors, as you'll know, this report we asked for two, two months ago, something like that. And um, it was duly um, put together by Mr Fitzgerald. And the outcome has um, gone nationwide, I suppose you would say, with a lot of comment. Uh, very good report stating the facts. So, Richard, if I hand over to you, if you do you need to add anything or could we want to go to questions? or uh, I'll take it as read, the report is read, so I'm open to questions. Councillor Lovett. There's a community, um, we too from here, I know it's going to mural forum, they'll probably look at it, perceive it, and they may do something or promote it or whatever. I mean, it's bad timing coming out right before Christmas when everyone, no one's really bothering about it and it's just going to disappear off the radar. Um, should we not be re-looking at this in the new year and, and having a bit of a go with their communities over it? Because some of the stuff in there, it, it is going to affect our future in this district majorly. And to me, we just can't shelve it and put it away. We need to act upon it and, and get get this, this voice out there. Okay, I, I could probably answer <coughs> the bulk of that. Um, it won't be shelved. Um, and it's Christmas is Christmas. It's got on the way. Um, we weren't waiting for after Christmas. Or it, the action on this needed to start as soon as possible, and it has. Uh, it will go to the mayoral forum. And at the last mayoral forum, it's a chair mayoral report, there's a, um, a committee, a steering group being set up of, um, and we wanted to make, at the mayoral forum, make it a smaller group of mayors of Canterbury, but everyone wanted to be on it. So, um, and, and the chief executive, so it's getting the highest um, accolades from uh, mayoral forum. So this report will go to them and feed to that steering group as to next steps from that side. Um, next steps this side, um, I think there's probably a question coming from myself shortly about um, uh, this report was done on 6.9 milligrams of nitrogen. Uh, the NPS of fresh water says 2.4. So I might be asking the Chief Executive to look at pricing up a report at 2.4 and see what the implications are. But it's certainly not going to be put in the bottom drawer and left. This is the start of the process. Yeah, uh, I've got Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Mr Mayor. <coughs> yes, very good report, Richard. But my question is actually... the. Mayor stole my thunder. I think we should uh, pass this, not, not pass this at this stage, this is chapter one. I'd like to see you um, ask to go on to do chapter two, which is 95% invertebrates have to survive, which is 2.4 or even, as Mr Joy says, 1% of nitrate, which would virtually make New Zealand shut down completely. So what's the what happens if we don't pass this, but we shelve it and say that you're going to do, a, have to be the chief executive, that it would be part two, which would really, to do the 6.9, I think most farmers, if they were given time to do it, they realise they have to do something and they would be prepared to aim for 6.9. I know it'll cost the community quite a few million dollars and um, perhaps hundreds of millions. They are prepared to aim for it over a, a decade or two. But that's only a partial thing. If Mr. If the government continue on with the 2.4 or the MPS as they're stating, this will become irrelevant. So, yeah. perhaps Mr. Mr. Eck. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's through you, um, Mr. Mayor. So the MPS for fresh water um, has been adopted. In September, the government adopted it. Uh, and included in that is 2.4 milligrams of nitrate. So it's not a direction or an intention, it is in now. So that's the first point. 
Uh, the second point is that uh, there is there is no uh, literature that we can find on the economic impact of a move to 2.4. And so in order to get this conversation underway and, and trying not to have a report that um, was around uh, best guesses and therefore able to be criticised and, sh and shot down around the assumptions <coughs> made, that was uh, when Richard was asked to do it on the existing literature. And that's what he's pulled from the Heinz catchment and then applied some really reasonable logic across the rest of the district. Because that is the only literature that exists uh, around the 6.9. So, and, and we labelled it a really conservative report. Uh, and, uh, and it was, because 6.9 isn't the law, 2.4 is. And so the, the clear, uh, uh, one of the clear needs is to have an economic impact analysis done at 2.4. And that's uh, the, the um, reference that the, uh, the Mayor was making to the need for further information in order to have the conversation with the government about the in impact of 2.4, which um, will, will be worse than 6.9, you know, potentially exponentially worse. So uh, one of the outcomes is to share the report to get... Uh, community leaders um, thinking and talking about um, the report to ensure that information feeds through to uh, the ministers and, and the government officials around uh, the economic impact uh, of the regulations, but also to signal that uh, there has been no work done on 2.4 in terms of um, publicly available economic analysis. And, and a, a clear next step uh, is for that economic analysis to be done at 2.4 to further inform the debate. Now, it, it may be that council um, signals their desire to um, um, get that work underway. It may be that council is part of that. It may be that council is looking for partners to uh, get that piece of uh, work underway in the new year. Uh, but that is a gap in the current... Um, <coughs> scientific knowledge, if you like, around 2.4. Thank you. Councillor Cameron? Um, Richard, thank you for the report. A question with regards to um, the reduction in farm profitability by 83%, and then you've written down here, um, this will flow through to affect 653 employees. Is that farm employees or, or just the ramifications of implications of not spending the same in the town, so it's employees throughout the district or farm employment? Uh, through the chair, uh, it could be either farm employees or uh, urban-based roles as well, so that we didn't distinguish between the two. Because a lot of our, our budgeting is based on, obviously, a, po a projected growth increase of 1% throughout the region over the next to 2040, I think. So clearly that will have implications on a lot of other things besides just a simple, you know, expenditure in the town or expenditure in the country. We project a whole lot of um, ramifications. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Mackay. Uh, <clears throat> Mr Mayor, um, I think it's um, brilliant that this council under your leadership has actually got the first report done. Um, I think we should absolutely pass it unanimously today to give you the lever to, um, and I hope all the other mayors get their councils or talk their councils into um, fulfilling it. And from your words, it sounds as if that will happen. Um, I think it's now beholden of us to actually do the economic analysis on 2.4 and if we can get some independent economist like Bill or someone to back us up, that will really give us the strength. <coughs> Councillors, um, if the Canterbury mayors go to Wellington to see a government like they have done in the past, I can guarantee you there'll be some action that's what has happened in the past and I actually got up at half past 12 this morning and I wrote a speech which I've now shelved after reading the Mayor's words in the Courier at lunchtime because I think we've got to be a wee bit careful there's been a lot of people that run a lot of big words together explaining what a dreadful report this is but it's only the Ashburton District Council under the leadership of Neil Brown that has written the hard facts and Mr Mayor, I will move a motion at the appropriate time that we write part two 
the, the follow-on chapter or whatever we want to call it because it will take you some time to get to Wellington because of politics in Wellington and until people actually arrive back at their jobs. <coughs> and I think we should get this underway. I don't think, councillors, we should nominate a particular person from this council table to write it. I think the chief executive... Uh, carries out our instructions and it would be up to him to carry out the instructions and the contract with whoever is deemed fit. Sorry Richard but I'm just trying to stick to process. Um, it's hard for me to say that with you in the room but you understand these things. So um, I think we should proceed forthwith with part two but we must pass this unanimously in the hope that the other mayors will get their councillors, their councillors to do it as well and then we proceed forthwith with the next part. Because actually there's going to be another part after that one. And the other part after that one will be, um, in my considered opinion, um, how much of the environment is actually um, will be left even after 2.4. Because my pick is that if you have a look around the world, Mr Mayor and councillors, that it is the wealthy countries that are putting their environment back together. There's an old saying, I think it says, um, prosperous is um, green and poor is dirty. And on my short travels around the world, I have noticed that, that the poor countries are really, really dirty. So if we really want to be uh, clean up New Zealand, if it needs cleaning up, we have to be wealthy. The only way to do that is keep selling high-end goods like milk um, on the um, world market because uh, wool, wool won't do it, councillors. We know the price of wool. It won't do it. I'll, I'll move the motion when you're ready, Mr Mayor. Okay, well, that we receive that report, that'll be it. Uh, just a question for Hamish. There were some questions in there. If we asked for a report of 2.4, you would um, get the report priced and then seek who contributes to it or, or how we would fund it? Uh, yes, so um, having anticipated that might be raised uh, at this meeting, we've done a little bit of uh, work, and I thank Richard and Steve for uh, getting ahead of that um, curve. Uh, and we've, we think that a report to assess 2.4, uh, and it does need to be done by an external agency. What Richard's done at 6.9 is pull together existing literature. I, the, the, the research has already been done. So it does need to be um, an external agency with the skill set to prepare that uh, research paper. Uh, we, we anticipate having made inquiries that it will cost between fifty and $70,000 to do that. Uh, we don't we don't have a uh, a budget for uh, that currently, uh, so the question th therefore is uh, if that um, if that is, is to be is to be done, then who pays uh, and how should council contribute or not uh, to that that work? So uh, in terms of the more general inquiry, we think um, it'll, it'll be in the region of seventy thousand dollars. Um, how that should be commissioned and paid for uh, is um, yet to be thought through. Thank you. Councillor Falloon. Thank you, Mr Mayor. A number of questions and comments, if I may. Thank you, Richard, for the report. I think it's very good. And I think if you read it and understand the implications behind it, it would scare the pants off anyone. The only thing I would say is... It does not go far enough. What it points out is that this county is losing $376 million in loss of profits and expenditure that will not be spent. What we need is an add-on effect, is what the multiplier effect of not having $376 million spent, what is the multiplier effect of that on the rest of the economy? And so this only goes part of it. The question I have is, we're talking about 2.4 milligrams of nitrogen per litre. What do you define nitrogen as? Because when we go to the World Health Organisation recommendations, they say that anything up to 50 kilograms per litre of nitrate is quite safe. But when you're talking nitrites, which is the dangerous one, then we're only talking about three milligrams per litre, which is very similar to what we've got in this 
um, legislation that's currently um, being passed. So what type of nitrogen is the 2.6 all about? 2.4. 2.4, sorry. Uh, through the chair, it's a not soluble nitrate nitrogen, as in, as in um, defined through legislative process. But is that nitrate or nitrite? It's not trite. It is not trite. Uh, yeah, that, well, that's how it's phrased in the legislation. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Um, now, we're talking on page 50. The assumption, uh, and that's at the end of the last paragraph under land use changes, the assumption is broadly reasonable, though it should be noted the large-scale land use change prompted by these regulations may enable new land uses to be developed with sufficient scale. <coughs> what sort of new land uses are going to be developed? With, with no water, no nitrogen, and uh, basically we're dry land farming. Councillor Flynn, just you said page 50, did you? Uh, yep, on... On Stellas. That's the infometrics. Through the chair, that's in the infometrics report rather than yep. my particular report. Oh. Yeah, 52 of... I got it. Yep. So, so that's in the infometrics uh, report rather than my report. So what they were thinking of, I, I can't be too sure, though general discussion is around, um, you know, a lot of a range of land use options, but they, they haven't really been defined for their fit for Mid Canada. <coughs> Councillor Brown. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, Richard. It's, it's a great report, but I'm concerned a wee bit for the layman like myself. What exactly does it mean? We've got 6.9, we got the 2.4. It's going to lose us a lot of money, apparently. What does it do on a farm? Is it 1 kg per hectare less? Is it 1,000? How, how do we have to see this as a layperson? I'm not a farmer, I'm a simple guy. Through the chair, well, that, that's the point of the, I guess, the knowledge gap, and therefore the extra research we need to undertake. Mm. So the modelling described practical changes on the farm to get to six point nine, but there hasn't been any modelling done or any consideration for how farms will, will practically operate <coughs> to achieve the lower nitrate levels. So that's the gap in our knowledge that we're looking to fill in by doing the research to, <coughs> to two point four. So anecdotally, talking to um, some people that know a lot more about this than I do, the, the, the view is that we're talking about a, an overseer number of about 10. So, so a dairy farm could be 60 to 80, for example, in terms of the nitrate loss now, or nutrient loss. So it's a massive reduction in inputs to get to a, a low leaching level. So, so units, pardon? Uh, well, that's an overseer number. Okay. So... Um, I'd have to check to see what the units specifically yes, relate to. Carol, would be kilograms of nitrogen. Hold the question, Carol. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, so, so from a practical sense, uh, we simply don't actually know what it's physically going to take at a farm level to achieve a 2.4, and, and in fact, there's a lot of concern that it can't be achieved. So, another question. You know, just just a layperson. You know, let's be a layperson. We've got a lot of them out there who are critical of what we're doing here. So, a 6.9. We can achieve this, and without losing too much money on the farm. Is that correct? What I'm hearing around this table, over a long period. Over a long period. But that's something we can do without losing too much money or work or whatever or production. Is that correct? Through the chat. So the uh, so the Heinz catchment in particular are on this pathway already. So they're not quite at six point nine, but while it's difficult, there is a degree of confidence amongst the farming community that it's achievable. What's not a, what we don't know is what's to get beyond 6.9. We, we simply don't know what that's practically going to mean. Thank you, Richard. Councillor Lawson. Yes, I've got a question. Of our local member of parliament is now an elected member, elected member, chair of the primary production committee. I believe, as some of you have met, was there any hope that she could talk to Mr Parker or where, where did you where did that meeting get to? 
Uh, perhaps I can report on that. Yes, we had a meeting uh, that involved our local MP last Friday, uh, and she, um, I think, was already aware generally of the pressure of the freshwater reforms uh, on the rural community. Uh, and at the end of the meeting, she had quite specific uh, information about some of the concerns, uh, and she undertook to take that back to Wellington. A lot of the a lot of the concerns um, are already w without having the data, but a lot of the general concerns have already been well expressed to uh, the, the minister. He was the minister prior to the election. Uh, remember, it's only a year ago that he was talking about a dissolved nitrogen uh, level of one across the whole country, and so the the lobbying of of that um, proposal uh, against that proposal. Uh, led to the 2.4. So a lot of the concern around nutrient loss and how to get there uh, is, is well understood in Wellington. Um, what, 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 what I think the gap, uh, the primary gap is, is hard and fast factual data around economic impact of that. And that's, the, that's still to me the big piece that's, um, you know, that, that, that needs to be done in order to prove the case that uh, the potential impact for rural communities. And remembering this is not just a mid-Canterbury issue. Uh, the whole of rural New Zealand is faced with exactly the same uh, dilemma. And different parts of New Zealand have different parts of the freshwater regulations that they're grappling with. And somewhere else it might be the pugging rules or the uh, fencing of uh, waterways or, or whatever. Uh, our particular issue is primarily faced on the nitrogen, but uh, that's not the only thing in the freshwater reforms. Um, so, so, so we have to collect up some more data around economic impact and, and make the case uh, that, and perhaps the case needs to be made around uh, time, uh, around variable um, limits for various parts of the country, which simply are not all the same, and where someone might be able to meet nitrogen more easily than some other parts of the country, uh, they may not be able to... Um, meet the pugging rules or something else. So there's just this one size fits all across the country that's proving uh, pretty difficult, but for different reasons in different parts of New Zealand. So yeah, so, so the MP has undertaken to take it back to Wellington. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I should also note today that um, the Southland um, people have sent a contingent to Wellington mm -hmm. around the winter grazing pugging yes. mm -hmm. issue. So that down there is important to them. There's nitrates is important to us. But um, we have winter grazing issues as well. But hopefully Southland working on that will solve our problem here. So uh, next up, Councillor Robinson. Thank you. And I just heard the farming program <coughs> talking about that subject as I drove here today. But I just wanted to say a good report. I enjoyed reading it. I learned a lot. But coming from a farming background, it's a bit scary when you see that our um, farm profitability in our district could decline by 83% as this thing's implemented and, you know, expenditure in the district by 23%, it's going to have a huge flow on, but I'm not sure whether it was yours or the Infometrics talked about going back to sheep and wool, which was where my background was, but sadly, even though they think that could be something we could be going back to in this district, unless prices lift dramatically, it's not going to happen. It's not going to cut the mustard and provide an income. I just want to make those comments. Thank you for that. Councillor Latham. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. <clears throat> I think this is one of, if not the biggest challenge this district has ever seen. Um, I agree with just about everything that has been said. It could be catastrophic, absolutely catastrophic. So we must continue. We must push forward and we must continue and get uh, gather a report at the 24 milligrams level, and if it costs 50000 or 70000 or or 100000 we must find the money, and we must make sure we get the facts, because the alternative is absolutely frightening. Councillor McKay. Oh, thank you, Mr. <coughs> Mayor. Um, if I may answer the Chief Executive's question, where's the money? Um, if what Councillor Latham said is correct, and I know it will be from the figures that I've read, we'll have a downward swing in our property that we own as a council. So therefore, I believe we could find it from the property reserves as a justifiable um, for... No, I'm serious, because if our property's going to drop, we've got to protect that property right. 
um, for the ratepayers. So I believe there'll be a reserve there that we can find it. I think also we should go to the other years in Canterbury to see if they will contribute to this one as well, because this is just not Ashburton. This is Ashburton leading Canterbury and the South Island and New Zealand on this issue. And, but it is so important to us to answer Councillor Brahm's question. If he can work out how many extra houses were built through the intensification of Ashburton, you can take those houses and families out of the equation with dry land farming. Okay, so you're looking at more than Richard's figures in my number. You're looking at unemployed 1,000 to 1,500 in Ashburton. Um, we have to remember, Mr Mayor, that in 2001, ECAN had done some measuring through well water and found that it was the dry land farming practices of fallowing ground to kill weeds that was caught and then heavy rains coming and washing those stored up nutrients in the soil into the groundwater. That's what started the nutrient search, the nitrate search in Canterbury on the plains. It was caused by dry land fallowing of ground for weed control. Roundup's the best thing that could have happened to Canterbury, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. <laughs> and and, at, and at that time, that was best practice. Correct. Yeah. That's how it started, dry land farming. Do you want to go back there? <coughs> Councillor yeah. McMillan. Thank you, and um, my question's for the Mayor. Um, so I agree it needs to go to the Canterbury Mayor Forum. Forum. What's the timeline on that? So obviously you're not going to meet again before... No, we meet in February. February. So it'll be a, and we'll have it agenda for the February meeting. <coughs> yeah. Councillor Cameron. Just a quick question for you, Richard. What is the range of um, nitrogen throughout our district? Like we've got the Hines, which is pretty good with the Mar. What are, what's our upper end in our region? Upper end isn't physical, the geographical upper end. Yeah. Um, well, the Rakaia River runs below 1%, from what I understand, so, so that's a pristine river. Um, but the, the issues do revolve around overland flow or river, river quality for the Heinz catchment area because, of course, there's very few rivers across the plains otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, so anecdotally, uh, talking with farmers since I've been in this role, uh, the, the well water that's reported, for example, the um, Heinz... Uh, sorry, the um, high bank water and other private schemes who, who test nitrate levels for, for their quality requirements um, are often uh, identifying water coming out of the ground, the spring water above the 2.4%. So, so there's actually, there is a degree of question though the, the science around the monitoring would be reasonably unreliable, but the, anecdotally there's, there's a question mark around whether in fact natural nitrate levels are higher than that anyway. Mm -hmm. But once again, there, there's a whole piece of work and you know, robust <coughs> research needs to go around it if we're going to look at that. Um, but my understanding is that we're, we're tracking okay to reducing our nitrate level in the Heinz catchment area, yeah. um, but there's still some way to go. So I, I can't give you a, a straight figure in terms of specific numbers, but we're still sitting above where we, where we need, well, we're sitting, certainly sitting above the 2.4% without so, so this 2.4 level that was um, adopted or, or suggested by the government, that's just how they determined that then, if the water's coming out of the, uh, the groundwater, possibly more than 2.4, was there no research done into so selecting that level? Through the chair, it's through, um, ec it's ecological, um, ecosystem health, I should say. So 2.4% so is sustains 95% of ecosystem health. 6.9% yeah. is 80%. So they've, they've looked at the effect of uh, nitrates on um, various critters and, and, and life systems. So and they rivers. didn't look at what was currently actually... From Not from what I understand. Naturally no. produ yeah. okay. Councillor Fuller. Thank you. So basically what the government is interested in is looking after critters rather than looking after humans. An interesting report which backs up the work that's in yours, uh, report Richard, is a report that was done by ECAN on the effects of making changes around Lake Ellesmere. And their report came up with very similar uh, conclusions to the report that you have done. Just coming back to the level of 2.4, though, 
It's already in the legislation, but my understanding is that there is no time scale on when that has to be done by. Can someone just inform me what is happening as far as time scales and when it's to happen? Yeah, there is. 2024, I think. Richard? So my, my understanding is it's broadly described as within a generation. Uh, that, that's right. So that, and, and that's about as, as uh, explicit as, as it's been around the 2.4 level. I'm not, I'm not aware of any more uh, precise time frames. Do the regional councils have to rewrite their regional plans to take effect of this, which they're going to start next year? Sorry, was pardon? Do Sorry. the regional councils have to um, rewrite their regional plans to take effect of the freshwater standard, which I believe is going to start next year? That's right. So, so the standards are in place now. They're legislated now. Yep. So, so any uh, rewriting of any of the regulations have to take effect of those new uh, the freshwater statement. Thank you, Councillor Mackay. We're ready for a mover. And you may want to add on a, a second recommendation. Okay then. Yep. I'll put your light on, Hamish. Ang Angus. Uh, Start again. I'll, I'll move the recommendation that the Regional Council receives the report and refers it to Environment to the Canterbury Mayoral Forum and other relevant stakeholders, both political and industry organisations, for consideration and comment. I think we keep it simple. Say that again. Oh, sorry. District Council. No, to the Canterbury Mayoral Forum. I'm sorry. Yeah. What I should have said. As per written there in the recommendation. As, as, oh, oh. So it's as, as written in the, in yep. the, on the paper. If I did say regional, I apologise. I meant yep. Canterbury As written Mayoral Forum. in the recommendation. Yeah. Yep. Councillor Flynn, second? Second. Any speakers for the motion? Any speakers against the motion? I'll put the motion. I'm in favour. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Carried. Councillor Mackay. Um, I have to do some wording on the fly. Um, I want to try and incorporate that we as a district council underwrite it so the work can start, but that we ask the mayoral forum um, to do a similar economic report based on 2.4 milligrams. So can someone help me? Who's the wordsmith around here? Do we want to ask the Chief Executive to um, look at getting a report done and the costing of it and where those dollars would come from in the interim? Does that make sense? Um, I, I, Mr Mayor, um, if I may, I would um, like, I'd like the Chief Executive to get started on this, so I'd like to give some slightly clearer instruction that, um, that the Ashburn District Council, maybe the Ashburn District Council proceeds with a further report on 2.4 and that we underwrite it from our property reserves and we ask the mayors of Canterbury to help finance it. Or others. Or others. Yeah. Uh, to, to just speak, as I understand uh, the intention, I think if we ask the mayors of Canterbury to underwrite it, they'll want a report for the whole of Canterbury and then, and then my uh, um, estimate doesn't hold. So, so what we did was seek a view as to what the impact of 2.4 on the Canterbury or Ashburton district uh, would be. So I'm not saying that a report across the whole of the Canterbury region, which is presumably what the mayors would be interested in if they're being asked to fund it, I'm not saying you can do that for 70 grand. Um, okay. Um, we leave the mayors of Canterbury out of it and that we um, fund it from our property reserves. I've tried to find a justifiable... Yeah. Funding place. And others. And others. And funding from others, yeah. if we can find funding. But I think we have to actually have to start it. Yeah. And I think you put in there the Ashburn District Council would underwrite until yeah. others was found, yeah. if they are found. Yeah. And yes. Thank you. Philip, has it got the. Like it redone, re reworded, please. Or re restated, please. Yeah. <coughs> No, it's not. It's one part. Uh, put your like, um, Angus. You can also Roger will come on. Roger. I, I was just. Uh, I was going to support Councillor Mackay, but I think if we have a, a motion along the lines that the the district council uh, proceed with the um, economic uh, analysis 
as to the effects in this district at 2.4, at the level of 2.4 milligrams per litre, and that we co-opt any others, other groups, that we believe could be helpful in producing accurate data and this to be funded at the best way we can, but it must be funded. You know, that's not perfect either, but does it help? <laughs> I think we've got the, yeah, we've got the just... I, I, a, I think we, uh, we, un we understand. Get on with it. Yeah, I think we've got the just... What did he move? <laughs> dollars to come from, which account are you thinking? Uh, well, I'm looking at Paul uh, because I, I don't know whether the rules around the property reserve would actually enable it to be accessed. I but think if we not should leave it to the staff to But if not that rest. reserve, then um, the clear intention of Council is to approve this uh, funding over and above our current budget levels and we'll simply need to find best place for that. But I don't know if the property reserve qualifies. No, it seems to me I don't think you actually need to state where the money's coming from. If you're directing us to do it, we'll find the yeah. appropriate place to fund it from. That would be the intention of my motion, Mr Mayor. Let, let's get on with it. Let's fund it as much as we have to. If we can get others to cooperate with us, we'll use them. But let's get on with it. OK. Good. Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Mr Chairman. <coughs> I'm against the present motion. I'm sure we're moving an amendment that this council investigate the economic impact of the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management and Associated Legislation. Rather than State 2.4, we're looking at the National Policy Statement as a whole, which has got a lot more than just 2.4. It's about invertebrates and all the whole thing. So it's much simpler than trying to... Yeah. Yeah. Carol? Well, I can't move it until... You've got an amendment. We haven't had a second for the first one. As, does the mover want to withdraw the first motion? Yeah, I can withdraw the first motion. First motion. Yeah. So now Councillor Wilson's motion will be the motion on the table. Well, the district Ashburton Count District Council lead the investigation into the economic impacts of the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management and Associated Legislation. Um, and then we can leave it to you to so, enlarge so, it with so, the mayoral so, forum and... Yeah. That just, that's sort of a pretty broad... Yeah, I, I understand. Just, uh, so, sorry. Yeah, Hamish. Just seeking clar clarity from Richard uh, in, uh, in terms of the putting our toe in the water with the potential cost of the um, economic impact analysis. Did we seek a cost of the whole uh, reform... Uh, package the, all of the regulations, or did we just seek the cost of examining 2.4? Because I just don't want to end up with a, a, a misunderstanding around the cost. We sought um, sort of cost based on understanding the move to 2.4. So moving, uh, looking at the whole statement will bring in it broadens the scope quite considerably because we'll need to understand fencing implications, grazing, uh, change of grazing practice, and so on. So that does increase the scope quite significantly. Yeah, uh, and, and that scope increase will, will mean uh, a cost increase, and, and 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 that is unknown. We didn't we didn't price that full report. Um, that we can, and we can advise you of that, and we can obviously do what council wishes, uh, but it would appear to me that we won't get that for seventy grand. Yeah. Um, moved, Councillor Wilson. Is there a seconder? Councillor um, Flynn, you've got your light on. You're seconding? Yeah, no, I've got something to say. You're not seconding? Oh, I will do. OK, yes. second it. OK, thank you. I just wonder how far this motion is going, though, in that what I would like to see is what we're directing our current discussion to is those who are currently on the land and farming it. To me... It Equal to that is the multiplier effect of all those companies and businesses who are based in towns like Ashburton who are servicing those because that is going to probably have a bigger effect on rural communities like Ashburton than what it will just on the actual farming community farmers themselves. Um, 
uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, there is no question there is a multiplier effect, and so your point you make is um, entirely valid. The issue that we have is that there is um, a lot of debate every time an economic impact analysis is prepared as to what uh, the multiplier should be. And every economist you talk to will have a different number. And one of our concerns in preparing the report that Richard has currently written, and one of my concerns about the future report, uh, is that it will be criticised for, for all the wrong reasons. And if, if we use a multiplier that somebody else um, doesn't like, then they'll attack the report on the basis of the multiplier as opposed to the real issue, if you like. So we quite deliberately uh, didn't um, use a multiplier and Richard quite deliberately steered away from a multiplier so that uh, it was a really conservative number. You couldn't argue about the impact of the changes uh, on how much you did or didn't uh, multiply something by and you just focused on the thing itself. So, so you're absolutely right, uh, but multipliers are a, um, they, they're as uh, hotly debated as overheads, and uh, it starts to detract from the, uh, the real thing. So I think our strategy was very much to, to say there is a multiplier, but we've discounted it for the purposes of our conservative report. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Just a couple of questions. We're going that fast that I can't follow it. Um, the nine, the nine, the six point nine is something we can achieve now. What I heard in the discussion before, if I heard this properly, the two point four is hundred years away, one generation. Is that correct? No. What no. was that hundred no, years? So someone said a generation was a hundred years. That's not generally what's. Richard, what's, that's no. what Richard no, no, no. So a generation is usually regarded as about twenty years. About every time someone breeds, you know, kids can't be I, I, I know that, but it was okay. So, if, if there's 20 years from now, why are we rushing into it just as a district and not knowing what we're doing? Because it was also said before to get to a 2.4, there's a lot of guesswork, no science, because it, no one has been there yet. No, and, and like you said as well, Hamish, we let ourselves open to a lot of questions because we don't have the answers. I think the thing to keep in mind through you, Mr Mayor, is that 2.4 is in the current regulations. This is not a theoretical number that someone's discussing. No, no, it's no. in there now. I'm not, I'm not so, and there is a lot of concern that it may not even be possible to get there mm. in a generation or any other time frame. But what you do know is you have to start working towards it because it's in the regulations now. You have, the farmers have to now be mindful of the whole <laughs> suite of changes in the freshwater reform, one of which is the 2.4, and, and you have to start working towards it. And one of the things that will happen is that the regulator, in this case the regional council, uh, will start um, behaving mm. uh, in a manner and monitoring consents and renewing consents and not renewing consents and putting conditions on consents uh, with a view to achieving 2.4 over whatever time frame. So for farmers who they, they can't just carry on because it's a long time away and we don't know what to do, because all around them, uh, the inevitable um, push is to do something and more of it, uh, and, and there is a real concern that doing something and more of it uh, will render their farms uneconomic. So, so it is now. We do have to be thinking about it now. We do have to understand it now uh, and be trying to prevail upon the, the government uh, that um, there's an information gap, there's a time issue, and one standard across the whole country is, is quite possibly catastrophic. I, I realise all that, but the 2.4 2 we, we have to go to, there is no time lim limit on it, as I understand it. So is that correct? <coughs> there is no time on it yet. So it doesn't have to be done next, next year. It might happen next year, but we don't know. Is that correct? Through the chair, um, the use of land in New Zealand is obligated to achieve 2.4 in a generation. So we don't specifically know Nothing. what date and time yeah. that is. So farmers are, are legally required to demonstrate uh, auditable proof that they're moving towards the 2.4 level, which means effective from September, they have to develop plans that, that will be um, legally enforced, potentially, through the, through the regional regulator that shows that they're, they're, they're 
implementing changes that's taken in that direction. If they don't provide that evidence, then they, they lose the consent to farm. So it's so that twenty year transition, if it's if, if it's that amount of time, is is actually relatively short for the scale of change that we're looking at doing. We can't keep kicking the can down the road. No. Councillor Cameron. Um, I just want to talk to the motion just quickly. I totally agree that we have to do a report and that this report demonstrates catastrophic implications for the farmers. So 2.4 will be cataclysmic if it's a greater breadth. Yeah. But I just think we need to know the cost of the report before we commit to it. Like, I don't think it should be open-ended cost. And I note, Stuart, you didn't have anything like it would be good if we knew the cost at an upper level of 100,000 or 150, like quite nice to have some parameters. That's my only comment. Uh, uh, thank you, three, Mr. Nair. Could I suggest that perhaps the resolution has um, got a caveat on it subject to understanding the cost? And following this meeting, uh, we will uh, get an estimate of that cost. Uh, and uh, we are aware that the council meets again uh, next Wednesday. Uh, for a couple of other matters, and we could advise the cost or a ballpark cost at that meeting. Um, I'm looking a bit hopefully at Richard that that time frame is achievable. Uh, but if we could get that number and bring it back to you next Wednesday, uh, then you could confirm that you wish to proceed then knowing the number, because it, it is difficult to plough ahead without knowing that number, I agree. Thank you. Now, I support Councillor Wilson's um, motion, but then others have talked about widening it to the whole NPS, but to bring it back to where this report we've received today, I'd like to add in there that particularly in relation to the role that primary production plays with the environment, because that's where Richard's report was targeted. I guess we're looking to go to another level with Richard's report. So should it be just focused back where we started on primary production as opposed to trying to do everything in the NPS, and then we'll get totally distracted and the cost will take off? But will you keep the focus back on primary production? That was the important words I'd like to put in there. I support um, Stuart's motion, but um, looking, um, we're an arable farm and we're farming on the overseer at seven. If we go below, down to this 2.4, the arable industry's gone. No dairy farmer can operate at this two point, whatever it is. So that there is major impacts. And and when you hear them on the other side, the environmentalists wanting us to go back farming for, as we were 50 years ago, that's not where we, we're wanting to go. And, you know, we need to get on to this now because farmers are making investments into infrastructure on farms and you're not going to spend a couple of million dollars putting on pivots and big irrigators knowing that you're not going to be able to use them in probably five, ten years' time. I mean, a lot of farmers are going to go broke over this and, you know, the farms are going to end up being owned by corporates and um, you're going to see families walk off the land if, if the government's going to push on with these regulations. You know, it's, it's important we move on with it and try to change their thinking. It's like this regenerative agriculture. It fits all in this, and we know it's not going to work in mid-Canterbury, and it's all part of this whole system that we're looking at. You know, keyboard warriors. Um, Mr. Mr Mayor, I'd like to thank Councillor Wilson for putting the actual words together that fit the moment. Um, I'm just wondering if some of us have spent too much time talking about the farmer. Subject to financial considerations and how much they're owed by the, owe the bank or financiers or whatever, a fair number of them will be able to survive. The ones I'm worried about are the ones that work that land, that work in the industry, associated industries. And that's going to tear through the heart of the towns of Rakaia, Mepin, and especially Ashburton. And if you think East Street's dying now, you wait till it gets a warm up, warm up with this, with, with this measure if uh, the spending tap is turned off um, to the extent in Mr. Fitzgerald's report. They are the ones I'm really, really worried about because the farmer may be able to survive, but it's the people that do the jobs and work in those jobs that will really have the difficulty. And they are the ones. They are the ones that need to hear this, and that's why we have to do the report. Councillor Wilson, another reply. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. 
I think we're only just the first step in the in the big picture. I'd be very disappointed if this sort of legislation, um, economic report was done purely for Ashburton District Council. The mayoral forum should pick it up. Federated Farmers should pick it up. It should be a nationwide investigation to point out to the government what they're going to do to infrastructure New Zealand, not just Ashburton. It'll be Gore, it'll be every Palmerston North, it'll be every agricultural um, town in New Zealand. It'll be Christchurch as well, of course. The, my idea is good, but it's more than Ashburton. I'd like to think that the Mayor would encourage to broaden it to Canterbury, and then Canterbury would be helped by the rest of New Zealand, by local government, um, rural and provincial, and on and on it goes. So it'd be difficult for us to give a figure at this stage, because it, if we do the whole system, including agriculture and infrastructure, it's too big to actually give a price. It could be half a million dollars, but to me, we take the first step along the... Th Just taking the right of reply. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I want to give an option. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Council Wilson, read the motion, please. Light on. Light on. Yeah. That the Ashburton District Council investigate the economic impact of the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management and Associated Legislation on not only primary production, but for the whole... Um, what happened? You give, us, give us a handful Ashburn, of... Ashburn, Ashburn District? Yeah. The whole infrastructure of... Um, of, of New Zealand. Oh, New Zealand would be far reaching. Yeah. Yeah. My understanding of the motion uh, was, it was it was an economic analysis for, for the Ashburton district uh, on the effects of the NPS freshwater management um, and, and associated legislation. Yes. Subject to understanding the cost of that report to be fed back to council next uh, at the earliest subject, opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Subject to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll put the motion. <laughs> I'll put the motion. I'm in favour. All those in favour, please raise your hands and say aye. 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 Against. Carried. Unanimous. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Steve. Um, do we? And here they are. Welcome, Bruce. Lauren. Bruce and Lauren, EMC, welcome. It's good to see you again. Your report is on page 161. Okay, I understand you don't have a PowerPoint, but uh, we have the report in front of us. So, uh, No, that's fantastic. Uh, good afternoon, um, councillors, Mayor. Uh, I thought it uh, just appropriate that um, with you already having uh, the report, um, I'm here to really answer any questions that you may have of both myself uh, or Lauren. Thank you and uh, we are welcome once again. Councillors, any questions, Bruce or Lauren, on the activities experience with Canterbury has been up to in the last, since we saw you last, three months I suppose, is it? Mm. Yeah, well, time moves. Yeah. Noticing a... Increase domestic tourism is probably picking up. Well, we uh, we hope so. Uh, we've had a quite of a, a bit of a lull on the last quarter, um, just simply because it is what we would consider as low season, coming out of that winter period into uh, you know the the very soft uh, uh, um, spring season. Uh, but we're hoping, and by all accounts, through uh, talking with our operators that are local, um, the forward bookings are looking fantastic from a domestic perspective. Um, so we're we're looking uh, very hopeful that we'll see a good um, good spend numbers uh, in the summer period. Great, Stuart. Can, uh, no, we've got Councillor Mackay. Um, Mr. Mayor, um, 
I'm wondering if you could hear the inside information on when the Australian bubble might actually operate. <laughs> Seeing that you come from Christchurch, Bruce, now, I mean, <laughs> work in a bigger, more nationalised um, organisation. Can you, can you see my crystal ball? <laughs> I, I, think, I think you're implying that anybody knows um, anything other than the Prime Minister. We uh, actually met with the New Zealand board recently and um, it, it was really interesting to get their take on what a trans Tasman bubble could or would look like. Um, it, it would be fair to say that even in New Zealand at a board level are uh, unsure when that will open. So who knows, maybe March, but I remember in... <laughs> my last March, forecasting it to open in September, so I've stopped predicting the future. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor McMillan. Um, Wilson. Thanks, Mr Mayor. Yeah, my question is, would we be better not to have a bubble? This district should be doing really well with two in New Zealand, because we're a, I think everybody knows, we're a through type of tourism not many people leave the North Island to specifically stop in Ashburton. Some do, but the, the Ashburton is, you tell us, at the supermarkets, the petrol stations, that's where the money's made. So as long as it's not travelled... If we open with Australia, a lot of the money that would be spent locally will be off to Queensland. So my opinion is, might, rightly or wrongly, that with local tourism, we've got a lot to gain over the summer. Yeah, I think you're um, potentially right there. I guess I guess what the Australian market does is it tops up, uh, you know, what we what we can't get out of the domestic market, and, and the numbers sort of suggest that um, the average spend for a domestic uh, uh, visitor per person is around one hundred and seventy dollars a day, versus an international, and we'll consider that Australia is uh, two hundred and fifty dollars a day. So it's just it's just if the more Australian market we can get in, the more we get a bit more of a buffer. Um, so, so uh, look, there's there's a lot of conversation around uh, the border and and you know the uh, the sensible points of it. Is it going to be safe for the general public of New Zealand and and, and so on? So that's where so a lot of the delays are coming from. So, uh, but but primarily, uh, yes, we can survive on the domestic market right now, and I think we've done pretty well. Uh, certainly, when COVID uh, come to play, uh, I, I predicted that we'd lose something like sixty percent of our of our tourism spend in this district, and I'm happy to say it's only 17.4, um, you know, which is um, considerably different. So the, the domestic market has really helped us to survive through this market, through this um, ordeal, um, and uh, I, I certainly think we'll see an uptick in the in the summer period. Um, uh, but uh, more importantly, if we can get those borders open safely, um, then you know, let's grab some money off the Australians as well. Especially if it's going to be April, it's going to be coming into that winter. Um, patch again so we can start getting out there and promoting um, uh, our, our ski seasons, um, whether or not, the, uh, you know, Mount Hutt is going to have the uh, um, same sort of um, uh, concerns and, uh, and restrictions that they had last year, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, you know, we've got a lot to understand before we get to that point. Councillor McMillan. Thank you, through the chair. Um, good to see your advisory groups met a couple of times and I see... Um, You've got that event funding, um, which ADC have applied for, I'm guessing. Yes, so what kind of events are you looking at? Are you looking at new events? Are you looking at events that used to happen and maybe could come back, say like the Big Ear or something like that? So I've been, uh, so, so you're correct, uh, there's $243,000 uh, that has come into the Ashburton district. I'm not entirely sure that that's been made public at this stage, but um, Verity, uh, uh, who's one of your staff members in council, is managing the events as per her portfolio, um, and we're simply giving her assistance in terms of what that might look like. Um, key things that we've uh, sort of talked about is, is definitely new uh, is looking after the big existing events, um, bringing in new events, uh, and more importantly, getting events on board that are going to force overnight stays. So, for an example, if we have um, a sporting event, um, you register on Friday and you run that on the Saturday. And so that forces people to come here, spend money, even if it's VFR, so staying with friends and relatives. They're still going to spend, they're still going to buy, you know, food and, and, and beverages and that sort of thing. Um, so that's really where we want to get to in terms of that. Every event has to have... Uh, uh, we've put a we've put a parameter around that every event that would be run would have to have 60% of the people staying at least one night. 
um, because that's where we build our economy of scale over over events. That funding you talked about is now public. Fantastic. Uh, no, I, I think. I, just did. Oh, it has been. Just oh, the, just oh the, really? Oh, oh. <laughs> I was thinking. Oh my God! It only just came in my inbox this morning. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't even signed the contract. <laughs> okay, there we go. I better sign it then. <laughs> cool. Yeah, Councillor Flynn. Thank you. Seems to me that the whole audit area seems to be a disaster. Quite frankly. I mean, you say that the 1920 audit has been completed and it's just waiting for sign-off, but before they can sign off the 1920, they've actually got to sign off the 1819. So which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Uh, Paul? Uh, through Mr Muir, I can give an actually update on EMC's audit. It won't be uh, completed till at least the end of January um, because it's going to their technical team for the wording of a qualified audit opinion and councils have been given priority over EMC so I was advised today that EMC won't be looked at till the end of January. Councillor Lovett, I have to come back John. Oh, sorry. oh do you want to storm on a... John, usually, usually, it's, usually it's speaker, oh, too late. We're under Councillor Cameron. Oh. Um, Councillor Cameron. Just a quick question regarding local tourism and this is again crystal ball gazing. But do you think when the bubble opens that local that domestic tourism will decrease again, or do you think it's going to stay at this level? So when the bubble opens, our whole our market will be greater than it was prior. It is a bit of a crystal ball. Um, no, I, th I think uh, I think there might be a fundamental change in the way people are thinking in New Zealand around around their travel. I mean, yeah, typically. If I go back and sort of, I, we did a small analysis of people that were on the mountain last year, you know, th through the back end of COVID. And the amount of people that were there that were either going to go to Fiji or one of the other Pacific Islands have said, well, we can't do that, so let's go and have a play in the snow. And I think now they've done that, that whole family change or that, 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 that mechanism of change, um, you know, might be positive for us. Um, we may not see the same level. I mean, pre-COVID, 89% of our market was domestic. Um, so we're very lucky uh, in, in, that, in that sense. Uh, we've spent an enormous amount of time working with the domestic market, making sure they know who we are and where we are. Um, and so I think we will be able to carry on uh, with that. Um, from a Christchurch perspective, well, I think it might be similar. Mm. Yeah, I think... Um an Australian spends twelve dollars to every one dollar that a domestic visitor spends. Um, so the impact of one Aussie would theoretically um, support the outgoings of the domestic visitors that we're going to lose. Um, I think what, when we're working with the airlines, we're probably planning the first couple of months to be completely full with either VFR or business travellers. So leisure travellers are, are likely to be the second wave. Um, and things will start to find a bit more of an equilibrium then. And ideally, the timing is fantastic for you guys in terms of ski. So Australia is going to, you know, they can't go to Japan. They won't be able to go anywhere else for their ski holiday. So could be looking at a really bumper winter. Councillor Lover. And of course, to top that off as well, we've got the Pookie Pools opening. Uh, um, and we've also got the new... Um, uh, chairlift that's going in currently onto Mount Hart, which is going to create a really big uh, buzz around the market. So it's very well timed. Councillor Lovett. I'm just going to ask about this. You've got the 17% down with, with tourists not here. Um, and we always say there must be a lot of um, people employed in Mid Canterbury using their bank cards from out of the district. Do you think we're going to get closer to knowing who are the actual tourists going through in? and people living here using bank cards from the North Island and elsewhere? Because, you know, the figures are still quite high here. Is it tourism or is it workers working in the county? So we, uh, last time we met, I talked you through the Canterbury Tourism Data Hub that we are establishing. So we're getting our core data sets at the moment for that. So we have a thing called TripTech, which uses phone tracking rather than card tracking. Um, so that's gone through the new privacy law changes and we'll get our first report on that uh, Christmas Eve, I think, and we'll be able to understand what the visitor movements are and where they come from 
in how long you're in certain areas as opposed to the spend data, then we can overlay the spend data and make assumptions around who is an actual visitor and who is a resident that is using a, an off-addressed card. Yeah. Thanks for that. Uh, Diane. Thank you. Um, this is looking at the brochures that have been uplifted at the library. It's looking a bit dismal um, considering the amount of Kiwis that are on the road. But uh, just a question arose in my mind. Uh, are we utilising the Citizens Advice Bureau now? Um, have we got information there at CAB now that it's open? Uh, unofficially, no. Um, uh, we have uh, four uh, uh, sites now uh, around the district. So Rakhaya, uh, which by far is the busiest of all of the um, information areas. Um, on average, there's around uh, sort of 30 brochures a week uh, that have been uh, uplifted from that, that point. Um, and then the second uh, busiest information area is Somerset Grocer across the way. Um, so I think uh, in terms of um, in terms of the library, uh, generally speaking, you know, travelling public quite often don't go to public libraries unless they're looking for a source of um, you know, typical information, but um, definitely the cafes, um, and we're looking at putting another one into a couple of other cafes as well. So um, haven't, haven't gone to the Citizens Advice Bureau at this stage, but we will certainly consider that. Supplementary, it would, I guess, be worth having them having the updated information because if people do ring there, we're hoping a lot of people are going to be seeking information those people there need to know that they've got the information at their fingertips. Thank you. Oh, but one thing worth noting is domestic travel behaviours and how confident they are on smartphones and websites as well. So, you know, from a sustainability and a cost perspective, increasingly brochures are becoming an inefficient way to provide information. It's much more cost effective to do it digitally and, and use smartphone targeting. So I think if we can upskill them in information, then that would be great, but potentially not too many brochures, maybe in the future, yeah. Yeah, Diane, Hamish is going to have a wee check on what's going um, with, with the CAB, so that will yeah. be good. Um, no further, oh, I've I'm just sorry, got no. a quick question about the brochures. So you're still <coughs> um, maintaining brochures at the iHub at the Mount Hutt Memorial Hall? Yep, correct? absolutely. Yeah. We're just maintaining their stock, um, yep. and uh, so yeah, they're, they're, they're putting the brochures on their stands, which is fantastic. Um, anywhere else, I go physically around to each of those areas on a Tuesday and uh, make sure they're all stocked up. And I sort of keep a bit of a general number uh, in terms of, you know, what's going out and what's coming in. Yeah, and I think that I have staff are, are making a note of the visitors that are coming in and yes, out they are. as well. Yes, yeah. uh, Councillor Lovett. Just going to ask, um, a lot of areas you go around, they have um, and it's a, a big, it's an A3 size maps of the area with all the attractions and stuff um, marked on them. Has Ashburton District... Have it, and they're on a tear off pad. Have we ever got done one of those for the district? Or, yeah, well, we've got three. So we've got an Ashburton map, um, and a Methven map, and a Rakai map. Um, we tried to do it as a whole of district, and it was just way too busy. Um, uh, but what we do have on the flip side of each of those is the wider geographic area, um, taking going right back into the Hakateri Park, for an example. So, um, it, it, each of those maps have, have that, that, that design factor in there. Thank you. Looks like we're out of questions. That's very good. Bruce, Lauren, thanks very much for coming down and um, sharing that with us. We look forward to seeing you in three months' time. So, and uh, have a Merry Christmas and a prosperous uh, tourism season. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Here's hoping we're going to get lots of Christmas gifts from the domestic market. Correct. Thanks very much. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Councillors, back to the agenda. Item number 14. The Burl government cost adjuster forecasts. Lots of interesting reading there. Um, probably more for your information. We have um, Richard, Emily rather. Emily and Tony. Tony, oh, to ask you any questions, Stuart. Oh, where do they get seated? Oh. I've got a question. On page 75, it's got mid-range um, Burl inflation. I think they're wildly pessimistic. We've put $100 billion into circulation all around the world. There's billions and billions and billions of currency looking for somewhere to go. And to say that inflation by 
20, 25 is only 2.2 or 2.3. To me, the logic is we're going to have a lot higher inflation than that. I know builder experts, I'm not, but I don't know what <coughs> you think. As a councillor, I would hate to estimate such a low rate of inflation in a 10 year period. Tony? Thank you. Through the Chair, um, I can completely understand your concerns. Um, the, I guess the saving grace with Burl is so they produce this for us for an LTP, um, but then each year they do an update on what the, um, to reflect what the inflation would be looking like for that next 12 month period. So this is indicative of the best estimate right now, um, but certainly in 12 months time when we're looking at uh, the next annual plan, they'll be giving us an update. Councillor McMillan. Thank you. Um, and more of a comment than a question, but um, just 5.3, the role of the local government, I think we've got our timing right with the building of the new Civic and Library um, building. Um, when you read um, the bottom of page it's our 82, 83, and then if you um, go to the ways of living, um, which is... 86 or 84 on um, Stella, um, just talking about more people working from home and the importance of um, having a hub, and I think that's where our library is going to um, come into play with, with that going forward. So it was really good reading that and, and connecting it back with our new library and civic centre. Thank you for that, Councillor Flint. Thank you. Yeah, there's a lot of figures here. And on the whole, they're boring, and basically, end of the day, mean very little. What they are, though, is do, does give our planners something to hang their hats on, and that's about the only reason what it's here for. You could take issue with the scenarios. We've got a stalled rebuild scenario, which certainly this territorial authority is not does not form part of. We're probably more tending towards the faster rebuild scenario. However, I think the mid scenario is a nice conservative way to do it and we accept it and move on. <coughs> Thank you for that, Councillor Mackay. Uh, question, Mr Mayor. What's the freshwater reform project that we talked about earlier this afternoon? The results, the probable results from that, were they included in which scenario? <laughs> Interesting really question. <laughs> So through the chair, um, that was part of our reasoning why we didn't think we could justify pushing us into that faster rebuild zone, um, even though we hadn't seen the report in its entirety at that point. Um, we certainly, from what we were hearing around the coffee table, was the impacts could be significant and severe for our community. Um, next question. Why scenario two is against scenario one, which talks about unemployment, shrinking population, because um, I think that report is worse than any tourism or retail, or retail trade downturn is going to cause it. Thank you. Through the Chair. So I guess we have to be quite mindful with the scenario that we do choose. Audit will come in and, and take a look and say, OK, what's the evidence behind you choosing the scenario that you did? Um, at this point in time, we aren't in the same league as perhaps Queenstown Lakes or um, Mackenzie District Council in terms of a loss of employment, uh, in terms of a significant impact from COVID that would justify us being down in that low scenario. Would the freshwater report that we um, ex received earlier this afternoon give us justifiable evidence to present the auditors for scenario one? Through the chair, potentially yes, but with the impacts not being uh, seen on the ground at this immediate point in time, it could make it more difficult. And, and just a comment, I think given the regulations are in place, they were um, put in place in September, you could argue that Burl had taken those into account. Now they may not have understood the complete impact, uh, but I think it would be hard to justify uh, going from, say, faster rebuild to stalled um, when Burl themselves have all the knowledge that uh, we have uh, and could have um, <coughs> equally taken into account the uh, freshwater reforms to some extent. 
So it's a balancing all those yins and yangs to say we think the midpoint is the safest place to be. What we probably could do is um, ask the authors of the report, the bill report, did they take the freshwater policy into account and um, factor it in a later date? But And they may say yes, they may say no, I don't know. But we could ask them, has it been? Yes, yeah. we could. Yep. Yeah. Councillor Bill? I was just going to move the recommendation if there's no other questions. Okay, any question? Here's a question. I'm comfortable saying. Okay. Yeah, I'll move the recommendation that we adopt the mid-range scenario of the local government cost adjust a forecast as contained in the bill report for the development of the long-term plan 2021 to 2031. Second with Councillor Brown. Right. Further discussion? If not, I'll put the motion in favour. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Aye. Who was against? Councillor Mackay. Carried. Recorded? Recorded against? Yep, okay, record that against. Thank you. Next item, number 15, following on the draft significant forecast assumptions, page 101. 99 on Stella. For questions of the authors. Emily or Tony, Councillor Falloon. Thank you. I see a lot of these assumptions are based upon seven-year-old information. So how robust can our assumptions be when they're based on such ancient information? Yeah, unfortunately the census data wasn't the 2018 data wasn't out when um, our forecasting assumptions were built, so we had to use the 2013 census information. Um, so it's basically the only information we had at the time to build these. We have undertaken a bit of a sense check to make sure that when the 2018 data did come out, that it's not looking a way off, and we're comfortable that it's looking on track at this point. In the new year, um, Stats New Zealand will be releasing their population projections from the 2018 census, so we'll be able to use that as a bit of a sense check too. But to get the LTP started, we had to have something. Councillor Lawson. Thanks, Mr. Mr Mayor. Page 119, Assumption 5, Ashburton Second Urban Bridge Funding. First paragraph, if this funding does not eventuate from the PCG or NZTA, we will reconsider loan funding or rating. I hope we never get round to rating because rural people pay 80% of the roading rates. It would be totally inappropriate to have it done by roading rates. I wouldn't like to see that sort of... We haven't discussed that in any way, that we will fund it if we don't get... I don't like to see that in there at all. Hamish? Uh, uh, thank you, and we were careful to say that we will reconsider. So that there's certainly no assumption that that's what council will do. But clearly, if the funding uh, doesn't come in under council's current uh, policy to have it 80% um, funded by someone else, then we will have to pause and think and talk about that. So all we're trying to signal is that uh, the funding would need to be reconsidered, which I, th I think is a fair enough assumption. Where that leads us to is, is more, I think, to your point. Uh, I have one question. It's on page 120. Of the, it talks about the interest rate variations. Cash on investments is assumed to be 0% over 10 years. <coughs> is that practical? Uh, no, it's very close to zero, but it's not zero. Uh, yes, Mayor, there, there's this, in the proposed LTP budget, there's this very tiny amount. So we might perhaps put a range in there or, or adjust it, but it's it's... We're estimating something like there'll be less than $100,000 of interest in year one. I think at the moment we've got 50000 in there, so it's going to be very minor because we've <coughs> the debt rate we're using is very low, so you can't, you're can't you not going to get it both ways. So at the moment, invest, return on investment is, is very low. And we're using 2.5% as the uh, interest rate for borrowings. That's What are we on now? What's there? Uh, the weighted average of our debt at the last report was 2.5%. Four or five, I was right about there. Yeah. Um, I will be looking at that again to see whether the weighted, 
interest rate when we borrow some more will come down. Um, but it's just a matter of how prudent or conservative you want to be on that. You know, you could go to two, but then you're, you're actually taking a risk on that. So um, as part of the uh, LTP budget production at the moment is reviewing all those things like interest rates and seeing where they're appropriate. Yeah. It's prudent to be realistic, I think. Yeah. Correct. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Flynn? Yeah, just following on from my earlier question, how important is the census in coming up with these assumptions? Through the chair, it's crucially important for the work that we do around planning, yes. But is it mainly on population? It's on population um, and any changes to our population. <coughs> um, that's our, it is really our single source of truth. It's the most robust data that we can access. I mean, having gone through these and looking at the confidence and risk levels, I pretty much think they're all pretty much on target. Thank you. My, this being number six LTP for me, the assumptions that have been going over the years have been not too bad, feasibly close. So I think, um, as you say, Councillor Palloon, this is not too bad. It's spot on-ish. That crystal ball stuff. It's crystal ball. It's crystal ball. Who thought there was going to be COVID? Yeah. 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 Councillor Brown. If there's no more questions, I'm quite happy to move the recommendation on page 99. Okay. Second, Councillor Lovett. Any further discussion? If not, I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Carried. Next item 16. Thank you, ladies. Customer privacy policy. And with Mel. Questions of Mel? Lane, you've got your light on. Lane. Oh, sorry. Just one question. In the um, page 123, item number 6, it talks about um, 2022 when the policy is due for review, but further over somewhere in the policy, it talks about five years. Is there an initial two-year review, then five yearly, or those numbers don't line up? Through the chair, um, that might have just been a mistake of mine, sorry. So we'll review it every five years, is that? Yeah, as it says in the policy. Right. Thank you. Questions? Do we have a mover? Councillor Flown, seeing it, Councillor Rawlinson. For the debate. If not, I'll put the motion. All in favour, please say aye. aye. Against, carried. Thank you. Thanks, team. Put item number 17 property leases. Welcome, Richard. Questions, councillors? You've read the report. This has been before as before in a workshop. Me reading a report, you want to go out for a pre consultation consultation, is that right? Um, yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, the recommendation is framed as receiving the information because normally when we go out to consult, you would adopt a draft. I'm simply saying that if you receive this information, we can go out, talk with the community about issues that we know may be sensitive for some groups, hear more closely what their needs are and then consider that before we adopt the draft for formal consultation. It takes longer, but it gets some involvement right up front, yeah, yeah. which is what we want. Yeah. Yeah. Try and get it right first time. Great, good initiative. Councillor Falloon. I note in looking at our um, leases and licences that other councils have um, reference to CPI Yet I don't see any references to CPI as far as our rentals and licences are concerned. I think your observations are accurate, sir. Did you have a question? The question is, why not? <laughs> I think this is an opportunity to explore alternative practices and come up with something if we think that's going to fit best with our community. 
I, I can't tell you why our practice has evolved the way it has, but it is what it is. Councillor McKay. Um, just carrying on from that, and the community may have some suggestions for us, Mr Mayor, that's why no. I would move the recommendation. Thank you. Let's Second get it out it. there and see if we can come up with something pretty good. Councillor Cameron seconded. Open debate. Be no debate. I'll put the motion on the favour. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Carried. Thank you. Next item, number 19, Ashburton Business Estate. Page 164. Road naming. Uh, thanks, Ian. The report's there. I think it's reasonably self-explanatory. Got some roads to name out there on the subdivision that council did on the old lot nine, and others. So um, names there been suggested. Any questions, Councillor Mackay? Oh, I move the recommendation, uh, Mr. Mayor. I think there's been a good process gone through and some good thought put into it. Well done on the names you selected. However, it was done. By the look of it, it certainly was not pulled out of a hat. There was quite a bit of historical background gone into those names. So well done. Second it, Councillor Lovett. I'll second it, but I was just going to ask, um, you know, I see you've got a list of names there that you're going to carry on, and I was just wondering, we've just lost one identity in town, and I don't know, is there a road looking at um, Roger Bridge? Roger Bradford, whether we should have a Bradford Road or a street added to that list to go on roads in the future out there. Because there's, there has been a business out on that end of that, start of that business estate, and um, they contributed a lot to this town in the concrete industry slab. Um, through the chair, I, I guess this, this list of names was actually put together some time ago. Um, by a group of staff and previous councillors. Um, my understanding is that if in the future there will be a working group probably put together if there were more new names to be promoted. Um, I, you know, I, I, I don't have any opinion. I guess it's councillors. Yeah. <laughs> it will be a councillor's discretion as to what, what names they might want to choose. So, Ian... Um, a working group will set up at some stage to consider some extra names. Is that what you're suggesting? I, well, it might be a question for um, uh, Jane, perhaps, to, to comment on. I think that would be a good idea, Mr Mayor, um, bearing in mind that that's just for road, roads that are council roads because yep. private developers usually put forward their own names. So, But we could certainly look at that in the future when we've got some more Thank you. vacant spots. Yep. Councillor Ethan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. On page 170, uh, the map pointing to the roads, I, it might just be a, a typo or whatnot, but Otley Street and Anster Street aren't actually pointing to any roads, but I presume it's the, the road that's closest to where the arrow is. Uh, uh, through the chair, yes, yes, well spotted. Um, it looks like there's some sort of... Uh, yeah. Technical glitch there, but yes, you are correct. I think everything needs to be moved probably about an inch to the left. <laughs> I noticed Anster Street was in the middle of a paddock, but never mind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Councillor Falloon? Yeah, I'd just like to support the um, words of Councillor Lovett that um, Roger Bradford should be added to the, any list that we have. Yeah, the working group will work through that. Yeah, good. Um, put the recommendation. Write a reply needed? No. Nope. I'll put the recommendation. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Thank you. Next item of business is still heritage funding, num item number 20, <clears throat> page 172. With the report in front of us, Clear has joined us. Councillors, any questions of clarification? First? No. Someone wanting to move a recommendation? Councillor Falloon? Yeah, question actually. Question, we'll have a question. Yep. Um, a total of two applications were received seeking 7839 
yet am I reading it correct and two that the Lions Club are getting the whole lot for the um, doing up of the Sexton's building? I think you may be on the wrong I'm item number sorry I'm on the wrong one <laughs> number 20 I was on 21 yeah yeah there we're right your question is pertinent uh, so the recommendation to the Lions Club is 476. Um, the requested amount was 839. <coughs> Councillor Rawlinson. Uh, I was happy to move the motion. Second it. Councillor Brown. Thank you. Open for discussion, debate. Question then, take a question on it for us. Avoid confusion. I'm st I'm still confused. Basically, what we've got we've got seven eight three nine to give out, and yet we're saying we've just been told that the Lions Club are going to get four seventy six. Where's the rest of the money going? There's a table there with it. So it doesn't all have to be spent either. It can be carried forward. Yeah. Clear, clear Councillor Flynn? I think it's... Yeah, page 175, there's a table with both applications on it. Ready to put the motion. No further debate. I'll put the motion. I'm in favour. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against, carried. Thank you. Now we go up to item 21, which is the Ashburton Museum and Historical Society, Society funding request. Questions of clear? I'm just going to ask, is there other clear avenues of funding to be able to do the history? Because I think it's important we start on that journey before we keep losing the older generation with all the knowledge. Um, I'd hate to sort of, you know, to stop this from the momentum of it gathering for the future. Right, um, just through the chair, um, yes, there are, rather than just purely rate-funded uh, rate um, funds. There are some um, external funding agencies um, uh, that, um, and also some of the discretionary uh, grants that Council does have, but, um, and that's why that second recommendation is there, that, um, that we work with the society to look for these funds uh, to try and encourage it to have money outside of a rate-based. So I'd like to move the motion. As is or adjusted? Uh, Councillor Lovett? Oh, I'd like to move the recommendation one and two as it stands. That is to, to, to uh, second it? I'll second, thank you. McMillan. And that is to decline the funding request but work with the um, Historical Society and Museum to look at other options. Yeah. Yeah. Further debate, Councillor Cameron? Um, when you're looking at the funding, are there any other ways around it? Like, can you... Um, do a loan. If the books are sold, can you take a can the council take a proportion of the the the, 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 the sales, or who's going to own that the proprietary intellectual property of that book and all those sorts of things? I would like I would hate to decline this unless there's some underwriting commit um, sort of commitment from the council that they would support this project. I think this was a valuable project. Um, and just through you, Mr. Chair, again, you, look, you're, you're dead right, and that's that's the intention is to meet with the um, with the society. I've actually had some personal involvement in in, in book writing historical books, and um, I'm sure that I can share some of those ideas. So Claire and I will meet with um, with Glenn and and his team to actually just think tank through some of those options. And there's plenty out there. Councillor Rawlinson. Thank you, and I was just going to comment too that I do support. I support the motion as is, but I do support the support that we're going to give them. I've been involved in the 
writing of a history book too, and it took five years to get it finished, but it was well worth the wait. So I do support the, the idea. Councillor Cameron. This is just following from my last question. I would like to see more commitment than we will try or we will do our best or we will support. Is there a, I don't know what the feeling is from around the council, but is there additional sort of support for that position? Like underwriting until can be funds can be used to, you know, mitigate it or to balance or is there any other You could move an amendment. Well I will move that amendment then. That we underwrite it until the funds can be raised from alternative sources to, if you like, repay or give a loan until it can be repaid. Uh, you could put a pretty large timeline on that. Just um, in the five years to write the thing. It's 2026, <coughs> isn't it? That ideally it would be finished. Just through, just through the chair, just in response to that, um, we just have to be careful with underwriting because when you go for external funding, you actually can't get funding retrospectively. The external funders won't fund you. So it tends to cut you out of that. Um, so do you still want to go ahead with the amendment or withdraw? Well, not, can you just flip the thing, Lane? If it's not going to be a reasonable, if it can't, if it's going to then block the, the subsequent additional funding, then no, I don't want to go through the amendment. But I just don't want to leave them that we'll do our best. I think we need to commit something more than that to the project. I think it's a very important and very valuable project. Unless it happens, as, as Lynette said, it, that information will be lost. So I think we need to do more than say we'll do our best. If that's what you're saying, Steve. I'm not sure if that's what you're saying. But if that's what you're saying, I'm not happy with that. I'm sure, that, Councillor, that you will keep them honest <laughs> to make sure that they their commitment is there. I'm sure that will be your role. It, it's standing in the recommendation, Lane? point two. So it's there on paper. We say yes against that. Councillor Lovett. I was just going to reply to, and say that we should have confidence in their staff. Um, let them have a go and see, and see how they get on. And, and if they can't, they can always come back to us. Councillor Cameron? One, just one further remark. They can come back to us indeed, but we might, might lose the person that they've found to do the writing and the, and the other things that have been lined up as regards to that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't support this. OK. That's fine. Councillor Lethem? Uh, just one minor point, Mr Mayor. Could I just record some slight concern the, the way Councillor Lovett looked at me when she was referring to the older generation dying <laughs> off? I don't know what she was thinking when she did that. <laughs> I'm going to put the motion. Can I, can I just make an amendment? Oh, you want to do the amendment? Yeah, I want to make an amendment. Right. Um, that will do the second point, the recommendation that the Ashburton Museum and Historical Society be asked to work with council staff and for 12 months to see what can be done and then it will be brought back to council at the latest for a review of the situation. Could you just do that again but slow it down? <laughs> and shorter. The amendment is as it stands, but there's a caveat to it that after 12 months, if it has been unsuccessful, then the council will review the situation with a view to funding the shortfall. Right. We second to second the point number two. For that amendment, do we have a seconder? Anybody? That Councillor that. Wilson seconded. Thanks. Do we do this? We'll do them one at a time now, Philip. I presume. Because yeah. so that. Well, so we we'll do the amendment. Yeah. So we'll do them all as one and two with the amendment. Yeah. Any discussion on that, Councillor McCoy? Yeah. Mr Mayor, I'm really, really struggling. I know the intent is really great to kind of underwrite it or guarantee it or whatever, but having sat on some funding organisations in the past and I got to hear about the second motion, the second part, I would walk away and not grant the money. So I think when staff say that they will help, that's actually meaning that they will help. So I, I would be voting against the amendment. Sorry, Carol. Councillor Flynn, speaking or for or against the amendment? I would be speaking against the amendment because I would not like to have an amendment that they can come back and we will underwrite it. Councillor 
crime? Yeah, I'm against it too. Uh, my reason is, as it was before, point two will say it. If the staff won't do it, they can reply next year. So there's a lot of things in place, but I don't think we won't, won't go that far. It stands there what's going to happen. So as it was originally, I will follow that. Councillor Latham. Uh, thank you, Mr. May. I would uh, pose the amendment also on the uh, original grounds that if um, other funding sources know that there's a, a fallback position that um, the museum can have, um, th they may be reluctant to lend. So I would just, I'd like to see the recommendation stay as it is. Anyone supporting the recommendation, the, the amendment? Because we've had three against and we're going to put it. I was just going to say I don't support the amendment either. I think we've got a good so, community so we'll, services team and we've put our faith in them. So we'll put the, put the amendment. Councillor Cameron's amendment. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against? Lost. So the original recommendation becomes the motion. And I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against? Recorded? Carried. Right. Moving on to welcoming new and long serving staff. And we have Rachel here who is going to introduce them. Rachel, take the floor. Thanks. Through the Mayor, good afternoon. I'm Rachel Holly Dallow. I'm from the People and Capability team. I'm standing in Sarah Mosley's stead. We have two new starters, both from building services and both building officials processing. Catherine Bolton and Paulie Crawford. Thank you, ladies. In addition, today we are also acknowledging the five years service of Matthew Lucas. Matthew is originally from France. He came to us while on a work visa under the holiday scheme and began work in our information services team as a business systems analyst. Since joining information systems, Matthew's role has seen him working across all areas of the organization working with business teams to identify new and improved work processes, and then helping these transfer to actual solutions. Of the many items that he has worked on, of particular note would be procure to pay, expansion of online services, and solution selection for our sports facility. Matthew is also a person with a positive, helpful nature and has played an active role within council as part of social sports teams, events and the social club committee. Matthew is very well settled in Ashburton and we are optimistic that in the near future he will have his New Zealand residency. Matthew, please go forward to accept your five-year service acknowledgement from Hamish. Thank, thank you for that, and um, congratulations, Matthew, for your five years. And Paulie and Catherine, welcome aboard. Um, we ready for HEB? Are we, Neil? Okay. Uh, Nick, next item there is the HEB team, and you all know HEB is the new roading contractor, and they've got one of the ejector trucks here and an LTMA Level 1 to show the councillors during our break, which is parked over there. I did say the keys are on it, Stuart, so get into it. <laughs> Uh, and the, the staff, new and long-serving staff, are more than welcome to stay for afternoon tea and have a chat with the councillors. Welcome uh, the HEB team. Good. Good. Um, I think, Neil, you're going to... Uh, if I can just mention, um, yeah. Conrad will introduce the HEB team okay. and uh, we'll go from there. Conrad, if you would like to come for there's two chairs there, but, um, yeah, come forward, push the wee button so the light goes on and our people at home will be able to hear. You're being recorded and live being streamed as we speak. 
So the floor is yours to introduce your team. Thanks. Cool. Uh, thank, thank you, folks, for letting us be here. Um, today we just want to introduce ourselves, um, who we are, and the team we have here today um, is pretty much the team that will be delivering the contract for, for your community, for your network, and for you guys. So first off, um, my name is Conrad McLean, and I am the contracts manager. So my overall responsibility is to oversee the delivery of this contract, um, making sure we do what we say, how we're going to do it, and making sure that it's value for money and it's what you guys are expecting. So we're really committed to making a change, um, working collaboratively with, with everyone, and making sure that um, it services everyone's needs. So we're really excited about the new opportunity, and we thank you as well for giving this, opp giving this uh, opportunity. So next to me, I'd like to introduce Johnny Brown. Johnny is our business operations manager. That um, is, is my direct report, and he will help me, um, guide me to making sure we deliver the contract. And Johnny will provide support and oversight to making sure we are doing what we say. Yeah, thanks, um, thanks Conrad, for that introduction. I'll just reiterate. Uh, what Conrad said and that we are really privileged and excited to be working with uh, Ashburton. Um, we've got uh, a long um, standing history and maintenance in, in the Canterbury region and we believe we've got a lot to, to offer and um, we want to work with you and the community to, to exceed your expectations basically, that's one of our main missions. Um, we also want to bring innovation and sustainability to the Ashburton uh, district and we're really excited today to be able to get the opportunity to introduce ourselves and uh, join you guys on your afternoon uh, tea break. And we've got some of the gear parked out the, out the front there, which we're excited to walk around and show you guys exactly what that is. So just to re reiterate really what Conrad said, really excited to be here. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And um, yeah, we, we, uh, we've got a good team and look forward to the next five to seven years and, and, and on. So thank you. Cool. Thank you very much. Conrad, you do want to introduce the rest of your team you've got? Yep. So behind me is Chris Kerr. Chris Kerr is our National Maintenance and Traffic Manager. Um, he will come in and provide some overall leadership and some guidance and really uh, making sure, again, that we're, we're doing what we say as well. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chris. Next is James Farber. He is our contractor's representative, and James and I will be working really closely to... Um, again, oversee and, and making sure we do what we do. James has a really good engineering background and he's an engineer at heart, so the numbers and design aspect is really um, at the heart of him. So having that experience and something I can lean on will be really beneficial. So James uh, runs the sale and maintenance contract as well. So with that experience, we'll be able to bring that to Ashburton as well. So it's James. Welcome, James. Next is RuPaul Sharma. So RuPaul is the northern supervisor for this network. We've broken the network into two areas, with Ashburton being the boundary, so north and south uh, replicating the same as Jeremy and Hernando. So RuPaul has come from Auckland, our, one of our livable streets contracts, where it had a heavy um, urban background. So RuPaul brings those skills of um, that type of work with, within the CBD. Um, and some really good knowledge around that as well. And again, in, Ru, RuPaul is an engineer at heart, so um, there's a method to his madness. <laughs> Welcome, RuPaul. <laughs> uh, next is Kenny Dawson. So Kenny is the southern supervisor for this contract. Kenny is, um, is an upcomer. He's come from Selwyn and he's been with us for over seven years. So Kenny has a really good, strong experience and background in the rural aspect. Of, of maintenance, um, and this is a really good step up for, for Kenny, so I'm pretty excited for him to implement all the learnings he's taken from the ground and implementing here. So between Rupal and Kenny, with both these strengths, we'll be able to um, make something, yeah, a really strong partnership to have the operational delivery um, out there. And lastly is Diane Yates, um, who is our contract administrator. Um, Di has been in the maintenance world for over 12, 12 years, so she breathes and understands the maintenance aspect of things um, through to RAM, through to CRMs, uh, which is a very important aspect, and just overall um, mentorship as well. So 
Dye brings a really good and valuable experience to this contract. Sure. Well done. Thank you for introducing the team. You've got your trucks outside, I think. Keys are in it. Stuart would like a drive. <laughs> At some stage, no if not today, another day. <laughs> um, roading very passionate to us in, um, in the Ashburton District. We're the, well, I think we're the fourth, might be the fifth largest um, roading area near. I think Selwyn just pipped us. They must have put another road in or something. <laughs> so we dropped one and they went up one. But we're very, very similar um, roading lengths. And same shingle and uh, compared to, to our seal. So roading is important. We get a lot of we use the word feedback about our roads. <laughs> so um, if you deliver what you say, we'll get on really well. Yep. So um, and I think there's intention there to do it, so it's really good. So we, uh, as if, if there's any questions, or if not, we can, oh, Lane's got one, and then we might um, have a cup of tea, go out and have a look at the truck and take questions out there. But Lane, go for it. Thank you, guys. It's really good to see you. Um, I've been on council, this is my second term, and there's one word I learned the first day I walked in. And I really want to never hear it again. And it's something called potholes. <laughs> Can you guys get rid of those ones? It will save us half the time. Yes. Thank you. Roger that. Ooh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. We'll stop it moving. <laughs> The pothole just moves. It, um, it's, it's the time to get there to fix it's the, probably the, the key thing because we know they happen. Yep. Yeah, so I think you're all on board with that. So we'll break now for a cup of tea, have a look at the truck, and um, yeah, yeah, and the staff will be joining us too, the new staff and long serving. So um, cool. 15 minutes, councillors, and we'll get back into it. Thanks.